It's such a happy crowd. Yay! So I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. I'm Robin Gavon. I'm the fashion critic for the Washington Post. Yeah. And um, I also would like to introduce our guest, the wonderful, the fabulous, Andre Leon Talley. <laughs> And just a, a quick little uh, bio of Mr. Talley. He was actually born here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and then when he was a mere infant, he flew the coop. <laughs> and he spent his formative years actually in Durham, North Carolina with his grandmother. He studied French history and literature at North Carolina Central University and at Brown University. And he began his career uh, essentially as uh, a junior editor at Interview Magazine. Yes. And he worked in Paris. He worked for Women's Wear Daily. He served as the creative, di creative director of Vogue Magazine. He has been counselor to a host of designers and models. And he's a contributing editor at Vogue and the author of a multitude of books, including a close look at the little black dress and a look at the work of his friend, the late Oscar de la Renta. He also has a new venture that will be starting on April 14th. And it's an interview radio segment or seg reg radio show for Sirius XM called Full Length. And he will, he will be doing the interviewing on that show. <laughs> and he also is the author of a really touching memoir that he wrote in 2003 uh, called Alt. And that's actually where I'd like to start our conversation. Oh, okay. Because you write uh, in your memoir really uh, lovingly about uh, your family, in particular mm -hmm. your grandmother. And you describe her uh, as sort of w washing and starching mm -hmm. the linens and ironing her linens. And you know, she made her own clothes and you sort of referred to her work as your sort of first introduction to couture, in a way. Yes. Her name was Benny Francis Davis. No, Benny, Benny. Benny. Benny, B-E-N-N-I-E, Benny. I'm not, am I not saying that with the proper accent? Did you say Betty? Benny. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said Betty. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm getting deaf. <laughs> I thought maybe I thought you there said was Betty. Like a, a North Carolinian no, accent no. that I needed to, <laughs> to use. I'm, so I just, I'm really curious how your relationship with her and your observation of her um, sort of shaped your earliest understanding of what style was. Well, first let me just say I'm very proud to be here, and I'm very proud to be the second guest of Robin in a new line. It's a great honor to be on a stage with Robin Gavon. And uh, when I grew up, I wanted to be like Robin, to be able to observe the world of fashion and become a Pulitzer Prize winner for fashion <laughs> observation. But having said all of that, thank you, Robin, for having me. Um, my grandmother was the single most important person in my life. She passed away in 1989. She was the instrument of unconditional love. And um, I learned simply style through my grandmother. She was a very humble woman. She was a domestic maid at Duke University for almost 50 years of her life. She was a maid cleaning up the West Campus men's dormitories. And that was the hard work. She used to get up at 7 in the morning and uh, be picked up by car, taken to Duke, and she would get home by 3. And then she'd do all of her home chores, domestic chores. And I have very, very vivid memories of my grandmother doing certain things, examples that you could never find people doing today. We lived in the city, but my grandmother could get up in the morning in her wrapper in the cold and go outside, chop the wood to put wood on the fire for the wood burning stove. When I was very, very young, we had a wood burning stove as the cook stove. I also saw my grandmother do things like skin a squirrel, <laughs> to cook in a pot for squirrel stew, chop the wood burning fire, and go to work and be amazed. So she was a very strong woman. She was, her fortitude was the strength in her faith. And um, of course, on the weekends, our lives centered around going to church. And she had certain rituals that she just took as routine. 
the rituals of cleanliness next to godliness. Everything in our house was washed and everything was ironed. My grandmother used to iron her sheets and they were Egyptian cotton and she used to iron my underwear and she ironed the towels. <laughs> and uh, she loved cleanliness and everything she did. And then she would on Saturday prepare the Sunday dinner for after coming from home from church. And then she would lay out our clothes. She would lay out my clothes for Sunday morning. And she wouldn't necessarily lay out her clothes, but one of the most fascinating things I remember about my grandmother, and the first moment I noticed that she was unique and had style, was my grandmother had silver hair. But she would sit and comb her hair, and when I was very young, her hair was sometimes blue, silver blue, and sometimes lavender. But I didn't realize that <laughs> She had gone and had the hair rinsed at the hairdresser. So I thought God had blessed her with blue hair and lavender <laughs> hair. It depended on what day it would go blue, and then some days the rinse would go lavender. And then when I became in, interested in style, reading everything I could about style, and just devouring the knowledge of fashion and style on my own independently, and I discovered Elsa DeWolf, the first great American decorator who lived in Paris in Versailles. And she had the blue rinse. She was one of the first women to wear blue rinse. So I found out that moment and I thought, well, my grandmother's like Elsa the Wolf. She's great, she's got style. <laughs> I, re I remember reading your, this, this memoir and there was this wonderful passage in it where you described um, preparing your father yes. for his burial. Yes, yes. And this was in, in 1993. And I yes. just want to read this paragraph from your memoir. My first stop was at Bergdorf Goodman. I bought him a good black Italian suit of silk and mohair, a crisp white shirt and gray silk tie from Charvet, cotton lisle socks, and the best underwear and ribbed undershirt I could find. Mm. I bought him fine white Italian calfskin gloves mm -hmm. because he had been a Mason, and Masons must be buried with gloves on. He loved polo cologne, so I bought him a new bottle, as well as a flacon of Van Cleef and Arpel. I thought he would That's like cologne. <laughs> I thought he would like to be sent off with a fresh new scent in the side of his coffin. We blacks in the South love it fashionable. We do. And <laughs> part of the culture of blacks is when you pass on and when you die. Some people call it the victory service or the going home service. So you have to put all of your energy or the money you can afford into the burial of your loved one. And I learned, amen, thank you. And I learned this. <laughs> It's church now. <laughs> We're marching on with Zion. <laughs> so I learned early on from observing. And I, I often didn't speak as a child. I'm not like Maya Angelou, but I wasn't like speaking. I did speak. But I was taught by my elders to speak when you're spoken to. So I really didn't talk a lot. I listened and observed everything. And I used to sit and listen and observe. And then when people passed away in my family, I used to watch the rituals. And I was very, very young when my great-grandmother died, my, mother's, my grandmother's mother. Her name was China, China Robertson. And she died in 61. And I remember so vividly feeling so alone because I was so young that my mother, I couldn't walk into the church with my mother, had to be in the back of the family recession because I was a child. I was a great-grandchild. But I remember so vividly the, the ritual of my uh, grandmother and her sisters preparing for this burial, preparing the black coats, the black dresses, wearing black, the processional, the ritualistic moments of calling the names, the first in line, the last in line, going and they went to pick out the casket. I was not there for that. But it was all very much a part of my mind. And I think that part of me, my fascination with French culture is that in the courts of the kings and queens, they also gave great attention to details about the burial services. And I'm very proud to say that I am very, very uh, fortunate that I have lived a great life, so I wanted to put my father in the best suit he could possibly put in to bury him in, the best coffin and casket, or whatever you call it, the best vault, and he had a Masonic service, which I just let them go and do it. It was all up to the Masons, and I just sat there at the grave. He was, you know, eulogized in church, in his family church in Roxborough. And um, these rituals were all very important to me. They're very important to me even as of today. I think death is a very important thing, and I, I don't want to be morbid, but you have to think about it. You're not going to be here forever, and you've got to prepare yourself. So you should be writing your notes about what you want. Now, let me just tell you a funny note about when my father <laughs> passed away. 
So we lived in Durham, and my father was from Roxborough, so we had to get two cars from the undertaker to take my immediate family to the burial of my father. And uh, everything went well, and we were sitting at the graveside, and uh, the service is over, and the masons are over, and they presented the flag that I gave to an aunt who wanted the flag. I had been told to give it to my aunt because she really wanted it, because she loved my father. I gave my aunt the flag. And I see them lowering their casket into the ground, and then they put a sheet of plastic over the entire coffin. And I, I, I scream, oh, my father's not going to dry clean this. What are you doing with that plastic? <laughs> I didn't understand why they were putting the plastic over the vault for. It was a joke. I said, get that plastic. He's not going to the dry cleaners. That was just my <laughs> When you talked also in your memoir about sort of the the going over to sort of the white part of town in yes, Durham yes. and reading Vogue magazine, yes, yes. and I mean, did you see a distinction between the the way that sort of people presented themselves on the white side of town versus where you were living? I didn't even notice living? it was the white side of town. I didn't even think about it until mm -hmm. one day the students at Duke threw rocks out of the car at me one Sunday afternoon. I used to always go on Sunday to the east campus of Duke University, which had a magazine stand. And I was so naive, I just loved the process of going, walking across the railroad tracks mm -hmm. to that side of town to get the Vogue magazine. In those days, it came out twice a month, January 1, January 15. So that was a process that I loved. I would also buy the New York Times and any other magazine that had fashion. And so I didn't really think that I was walking in the white part of town. I didn't even notice the people in that part of town. I, was, I had a vision, I had a single tunnel vision. I was going to that magazine store to get the Vogue. And I was reading Vogue at an early age and Vogue was the escape moment for me. Vogue, I read every caption, I read every, every I can almost, you can talk about Vogue in the 60s and I can tell you what they read. <laughs> Or the captions, I read the captions about men in Vogue, Camille Duhay was the editor. I read all the boutique pages. I read everything and I loved the Vogue. It was my escape world into another world that was beyond my world at home. I loved Vogue. And <laughs> <laughs> did, it, did it start to shape how you dressed yourself? Oh, absolutely, it shaped everything. I mean, I was the only child, and I grew up in my grandmother's house, and she gave me free reign of the house. So she had an extra room. It was a very modest house. Sometimes we almost froze in the winter because we didn't have central heating. And I remember we just had five blankets on the bed, and my grandmother loved the cold bedroom, but I did not. But um, <laughs> I remember she gave this room, and she had it painted pink. And I realized it was a scaparelli pink when I got up very sophisticated and started reading things, like Elsa the Wolf. But she had the room painted pink. It could have been her sewing room. She gave it over to me. I, she bought me a sofa and a desk. And my father bought me a typewriter. And I made that room my own. And I used to read everything. So of course, I was reading esoteric books and things from the library. I'd go to the Durham Public Library. I was reading John Fairchild, the late you know, John Fairchild yeah. from Women's Wear Daily. He wrote a great book called The Fashionable Savages. And that was my Bible in high school. I was running around in junior, I was in 11th grade, screaming and running around, CC gas, CC gas, Gloria Vanderbilt, Gloria Vanderbilt. And did anyone know what you were talking no, about? I, I explained who these people were. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, one of my, the, uh, the person that was the most, p most uh, moment of perfection was Anne Bibby, who was the homecoming queen. And her mother dressed her beautifully to be the homecoming queen in a beautiful boucle tweed coat and matching dress. Very, very, very chic and very elegant. And I used to always talk to her about a season guest. And I just recently met her l last year after 50 years. And we had lunch. And she said, you remember you used to go around talking about CC Guest in her man Boucher suits in high school? I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it did, it did absolutely motivate me, Vogue. But then I remember reading in Vogue, somewhere I may have seen a picture of Lady Ottoline Morel. Ottoline Morel was a very high English aristocrat and an eccentric. And I must say, Ottoline Morel, mm -hmm. Cecil Beaton, the English eccentrics all inspired me. Everything that I read, the literature of Leslie Blanche, The Wild Shores of Love, so all this was totally giving me inspiration, and I just went wild with my moments of, you know, this is who I am. I, I remember when I went off to college, I was wearing um, purple rouge on my cheeks <laughs> because Naomi Sims was in vogue wearing purple rouge. <laughs> I was wearing curtain tassels. And I hadn't even seen Gone with the Wind like Scott O'Hara. <laughs> <laughs> but I was wearing silk curtain tassels, which the idea came from the Vogue, the boutique pages, the men in Vogue. And I had beautiful tuxedo shirts, beautiful 
pleat-fronted tuxedo shirts that I saved my money that I bought in Chapel Hill at a very chic store. And I would wear these black silk rope tassels and I'd go to class and the people, the professors would just look at me and they said, well, what is this? And I said, it's just my look for today. And I'd wear, <laughs> I'd wear capes to the floor. I had a beautiful black rubberized policeman's cape that I bought in some junk shop. And I used to read Vogue, and then it would inspire me to decorate my room. And then I would actually, believe it or not, I'm very good with my hands, and I would actually upholster my chairs, inspired by things I'd read in Vogue. Angelo Dongia and his striped tents. He would have beautiful rooms, and there would be tents of fabric, and I would take the gold poster chairs and upholster my chair. It was one of my favorite chairs. I had so much fun upholstering it. And I used to upholster my benches. I had a bench that my grandmother sat in to comb my hair, and I took fake fur and covered that bench. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine being, being you in the 19, what was this, the 60s, 70s? This is 1966, 19, 65. 1965. Oh, yes, I was and, like this in 65. In North Carolina. Oh, yes, North Carolina. I mean, oh, I was bullied. I mean, I was going to say, I mean, people talk even now of, you know, dressing slightly yes, outside yes, of the box yes, in a yes, small yes, town yes. or outside of a big city oh, yes, and yes. the kind of negative attention that they get. How difficult was it for you to well, just be yourself? I was very protected because um, I went to school and I studied. Now, when I was in high school, I wasn't as completely this today. I was going to high school in normal clothes, in beautiful clothes that my grandmother saved her money to buy. I had V-neck sweaters. I remember my first beautiful sweater was a V-neck mm -hmm. yellow cashmere sweater. I had a beautiful stadium coat and plaid corduroy, gold corduroy with a plaid lining. So in school, in high school, I really, really dressed conservatively. I had the blue suits, I had the Italian moccasins, but when I got to college, that's when I burst forth. Yeah. And I just let it go, because I was going to college, freshman, and, and when I got to Brown, I really let it go there. <laughs> I mean, I had some, uh, when I think back on it, I was running down to uh, classes in bell bottoms that were above the ankle that had been bought in the thrift shop, you know, sailor bell bottoms, I bought them too short so you could see the ankles, and shoes with Cuban heels. And then I read in Bazaar that Naomi Sims put Vaseline on her cheeks and, and then rouge, uh, Estee Lauder purple. I was doing all of that. I was glossing my cheeks and my forebrow with rouge running off to class. And it was difficult, but um, I was bullied in high school, but I wasn't overly dressed in an outrageous original way, mm -hmm. but I was bullied, but I coped and survived with it. I mean, it was very difficult in high school for me. I, it's hard to be an original and to be confident and to go forth in the world, but somehow I did it. But, you know, the, the boys, some of my best friends, some, Bruce is still one of my best friends, he grew up mm -hmm. on my street. They were horrible to me. I remember when Christmas, when um, I knew who Santa Claus wasn't because I found the Roy Rogers cowboy suit behind the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a revelation that it, there was no Santa Claus. So, hey, they put it behind the sofa and you pick it up on Christmas morning. <laughs> and so I put on my Roy Rogers cowboy suit and I had everything. My father paid for everything. I had Western towns, you know, Western towns. I had drums, my first set of snare drums. And so I put on my cowboy suit, and Bruce Weaver and the late Reginald Hinton tricked me into going into the yard of a neighbor, and they had dug a hole and put mud in it. And they tricked me into going into the hole, and I ran into the hole the first day I had my suit on, mm. fell in the hole with mud and split the trousers, you know, at the knee, and I threw the suit away. And I remember that vividly. I remember one day it was a, a snow day, and I went out in our yard and built a beautiful snowman with the carrots and the coal eyes, and et cetera, et cetera. And Reginald Hinton came up, and he knocked the snowman down. I went in the house and had Campbell's soup. But <laughs> Reginald Hinton was a bully. He's dead. <laughs> and you went to New York. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was the second, I'm, I'm going to guess that perhaps the second most important woman in your life, or the third after your yes, mother and your grandmother, yes, was yes. Diana Vreeland. Diana Vreeland was everything to me. I just knew who Diana Vreeland was because I was in that pink room painted and by my... for anyone who does not know who Diana Vreeland was... Do you was, not know? Raise your hand. Everyone here knows no, who Diana Vreeland is. No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> no, Batman, everyone here knows who Diana Vreeland is. Yes, 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 yes. Well, she's, she's a, a legendary, the legendary Diana Vreeland who was a great editor at Vogue who went on to the Classroom Institute and had these great ex exhibitions. Well, 
when I was young and I was reading Vogue, Diana Vreeland was, had been dismissed from Vogue in 71. So my walls were people, papered with all the, the fabulous stories from her magazine, including a fabulous story that had been done in Life magazine by the late Sally Kirkland, who had run a beautiful profile of Mrs. Vreeland in her office. And this is the thing that I loved the most. I had two great moments in my childhood. I loved to read everything in Vogue, edited by Diana Vreeland, and I loved John Fairchild, who wrote The Fashionable Savages. Little did I know when I got to New York, I would end up meeting Diana Vreeland and I volunteered for her in 1974 on her second exhibit called Romantic and Glamorous Hollywood Design. And I would end up eventually working for John Fairchild at Women's Wear Daily. Now, I'm just an humble black man from the South. I'm supposed to go off and be in the army, but I didn't. I'm supposed to do something, I know, teach in high school or teach in some grade school. And I go off to New York. I had to get out of town. I just had to. It's like Mary Tyler Moore. You know? <laughs> I had to get out of Durham. I just, I had a hungering for the life I saw in Vogue. And I never calculated that I am on a path, a trajectory to get to Vogue, to get to Women's Red Daily. It just happened for me. And I'll tell you why it happened for me. Because knowledge is power. And I did my homework. And I was a very serious student. And I loved, I loved French, French literature, French history. My favorite teacher was French. I had French one, two, three, and four all through high school, Cynthia P. Smith was my favorite teacher. And she was so inspiring, you know. She'd go away on the summers, every summer she'd go on a trip to France by herself, come back with the slides and show them to her. And she bought two dresses in Paris. She bought a red dress and she bought a black and white house to dress. Both the dresses were the same cut and she'd wear them the day she printed the slides. It was like Jean Brody, the prime of Jean Brody. <laughs> and um, so it was just very inspiring to, to, to meet Deanna Vreeland. And I can't tell you. What, I'm, I'm curious because the, she's so larger than life and there's yes, so much yes, that you could just yes, sort of absorb yes. from her. But were there like key lessons about, that you learned from her about the way that she thought about oh, fashion? Oh, absolutely. Because she was so known for connecting it to. Me, she taught me so much. And when I first met her, I, was, I had a letter of introduction to the museum to go work there and volunteer. I didn't make it, I was a volunteer. They didn't call them interns, but I was a volunteer. Romantic, glamorous Hollywood design. In those days, I think we were about 12 volunteers. Mm -hmm. And I, including Robert Turner, that I went to school with, he was at RISD, and Tony Goodman, who's now at Vogue. And I just discovered that the list of the volunteers for that show was about 12. Right. And the day would be about 100, so. And under, you were unpaid. Unpaid, unpaid. Just... <laughs> and didn't even think about it, didn't think about it. And so I realized that Mrs. Reeland she based everything on a narrative. She based everything on literature. And the, one of the lessons I learned is behind every great design, behind every great collection, there is a narrative. Try to get to know the narrative of that designer. Try to get into the mindset of the designer. Ask questions. If Mr. Saint Laurent, the late great Mr. Yves Saint Laurent, was inspired by a great collection in 1978 when I went to Paris, it was the apogee of my career when I was young. It was called the Porgy and Best Collection. So it was my job as fashion editor to ask Mr. Saint Laurent, well, how would you be inspired by Porgy and Best? It's an opera written by George Gershwin of the Great South. And the simple answer was that from this great moment in Mr. Saint Laurent's world, he was listening to the music. He'd never been to the South. He was listening to the music in his Volkswagen radio on his way to work one morning, and it gave him the inspiration to make these very fluid gowns and very beautifully structured clothes that were very reminiscent of the way women were dressed in the South, it's particularly on church mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Reeland had a process. The first lesson I learned from her was to listen, to sit there and listen and be in awe of her because she was bigger than life. So when I was called into her office, I was very humble, and she sat at her desk, and it was all red, and it was all very grand and very beautiful. And she took a legal pad out, and she wrote, and she wrote so big I could read it from that side of the desk. And she wrote, <laughs> Andre, the helper. And then she stood up, and she says, now you will stay by my side for the rest of the show. So one of the first assignments I had was Claudia Colbert's dress, Gold Tissue Lame Adrian, from the 1939 black and white version of, is it Cleopatra? Yeah, Cleopatra. And so Mrs. Vreeland called me to the office and said, she stood up and she said, 
She didn't say, I want you to do this dress in gold. I want you to have a gold mannequin. I want it to look like the sun of Egypt. It's got to be all gold because this is tissue gold. It's the best dress made in Hollywood by Adrian, by dressmakers that came from France. She stood up and she put her head in the air and she said, now, you know, Cleopatra, she's a queen, but she's a teenage queen. And she lives in Alexandria, Egypt, and she spends all day in the sun, and all day she's glorious in the sun. Now remember, she's a teenage queen, and she loves her white peacocks, and all day she loves to walk in the sun and her white pe peacocks behind her. Now get cracking, Andre, and then I'd go into the gallery. <laughs> I'd say, oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> but this led me to think, and I had to come up with an idea for her to approve of, and I kept looking at the gold tissue dress on the mannequin, and it was, you know, a normal mannequin, and it was a beautiful gold swimsuit cut dress with a train, mm -hmm. Claudette Colbert, just a beautiful dress, well-preserved, excellent. And I kept thinking, she's a queen, and she lives in the sun, she's gold. It's a golden sun, and she's got white peacocks. What do I do? So I went to one of the technical curators at the museum and I mm -hmm. said, am I allowed to paint that mannequin? And they said, yes, depends on what kind of paint you're gonna get. We'll have to okay. approve the paint. So I said, spray paint. They said, yes. So I said, give me a can of gold. So I took the can, shh, all up and down the mannequin, two and three layers of gold. Mm -hmm. And then I put the tissue gold dress on the gold mannequin. The gold was the same color as the dress. And I had gotten the idea from Goldfinger. You remember the James oh, yeah. Bond movie? <laughs> when a girl dies right. and she's been sprayed in gold, but her skin cannot breathe. But I love the idea. That's where the idea came from, the gold on the gold. And Mrs. Reedland walked by and she thought it was like incredible. She said, it's perfection. And she just like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so when she did the Russian show, when she went to Russia, she would love passages from War and Peace. She would love reading, she loved literature because it, it came alive in her mind. So these vignettes of fashion mm -hmm. in the exhibit would be given from great moments of sharing literature or paintings. I mean, it's two of the things that you keep coming back to, it's knowledge and it's listening. And it reminds me of where we are now yes. with so much, uh, emphasis on social media yes, and Instagram yes. stars yes. and yes. selfies. Do you find that that interest in sort of the history of fashion, the legacy, the traditions, do you find that it's gone missing or do you still feel that it's there? I think, I think that people are so, I don't want to say a bad word, <laughs> but <laughs> fractured, I'll say fractured. The world is fractured and we're off the cliff. And everything, everything is so distracting. You're so busy, and I am also on that cell phone. Mm -hmm. And I love parties or weddings when you go and they collect your cell phone. You go to weddings today, they take, put the cell phone in a basket. You go to parties, you put that cell phone away. You're so distracted by your social media, there's someone in the back there now looking at his cell phone instead of listening. <laughs> <laughs> and there you are, put it down, put it down. Yeah, there, he's Googling Diana Breland. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, it's very important, you know, Robin, to, to give you all credit, when you did the great uh, book you did on Versailles, it just so came alive. Who would have thought that you could sit down and do a book in under two years on the history of that great moment in Versailles when the African-American model became world class and became known globally because the American designers featured and highlighted the great African-American design uh, models, Pat Cleveland, Beth Ann Hardison, Billy Blair, Alva Cheen, and all those fabulous girls. They were great models, the white girls, Elsa Peretti, but Marissa Marinson, but that, that is the moment when there's history. That book is about the history, and history is very important. You can only... Thank you, thank you. You can only go forward if you know the past. That's, it, it, that, that relates to everything in culture. I, I can only be the man I am because I'm very connected to my past, to my roots. I am very well aware of what my grandmother struggled. She struggled. She was a woman of great modesty, that my whole family was not a, a fluent family, but they had faith. The church gave them the strength that kept us going throughout the generations. You have to be aware of your past. And uh, if I love French fashion, it's because I know uh, Marie Antoinette almost yeah. everything. I know my, Madame de Pompadour, the Madame du Barry. I love that. And I love, I love Russian literature and I love Russian history. And I'm just so fascinated when I can just pick up a book and crack the page and learn something new.
And I don't think there's enough of that. And I'm almost telling you that it's very dangerous to modern society and the, this whole thing of internet and all of that in the computer. Because you know what? I've almost forgotten how to write. My penmanship is cracky because I'm so busy on the computer that I've forgotten how to write handwritten notes and I sort of get quibbly nervous. And this morning I was thinking, I'm almost forgetting about how to read because of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> but Netflix is good, let me just tell you. <laughs> yes, get into Grace and Frankie, please. Yes. I binged, let me just tell you, I binged on that. I looked and started at a four and I was going around the clock to four. That is the best thing about getting old. I am 16 years old, and Jane Fonda is 70 in the movie, and that is the best thing for us. <laughs> also on uh, Netflix is the most incredible thing, The Crown, the story of Elizabeth I. And so I need to pick up the book and read. <laughs> You brought up two things. You yes. brought up you brought up models, and you brought up diversity, and that, of course, has yes. been yes. Uh, a big part of the fashion conversation. Yes, it has. Diversity yes. in general has been part of the cultural yes. conversation. Yes. D your y your sense of diversity in in the fashion industry. There's this wonderful uh, profile of you that was done uh, in I think 2003 ish mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, by Hilton Alls yes. in the New Yorker, and yes. it was called the Only One. Yes. And I think now, if it was done, it would probably read one of the few. One of the few. Yeah. The chosen few. I think diversity is a very <laughs> important thing in fashion. I, I don't really, uh, Abba was asking me in the car, who are the upcoming editors? And I said, there are no Robin Gavonza or Maureen Dowd today, except for the young lady who is the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. You know, yeah. uh, when, when you get to the point that I did, and let me just say, my career when I was young, I didn't think of black versus white or any other ethnic group. I just went through my career and I just did it. You know, The other day, uh, a friend was telling me how we went to a Calvin Klein party in 1975. There were 400 people and Bernadine Morris wrote about all the socialites and she wrote in this big, big column well, there were 400 people at Calvin Klein's party, but everyone was talking about Andre Leon Talley in his khaki Bermuda shorts and knee socks. <laughs> and I just thought, well, I just, that's who I am. That's what I did. That's what I loved. My grandmother allowed me to do this. My grandmother allowed me to do everything, except I had a hard chores. I had to clean up that kitchen, wash those dishes, and scrub that porch. I had to scrub that porch in the summer times. Scrub it, scrub it, and get it glistening. I had to wax those floors with Johnson's Paste Wax and dust, and therefore I have learned. I don't dust now, I have a cleaning lady, but. <laughs> you can always fall back on the things that you have learned from home, and they always will be with you. And I think that uh, diversity is a very important thing. I think that I must have crashed the glass ceiling, and I just live to continue to crash the, the glass ceiling, I hope. Uh, Why know. do you think, I mean, it, it, it does seem like diversity ebbs and flows in fashion, yeah, and certainly flows. with models, yes, yes. Uh, but sort of in other aspects mm -hmm. of it, whether in the magazines, mm -hmm. in retail, I mean, why do you, if you had to guess, w are there any particular aspects of fashion that somehow make diversity more of a challenge in that industry? I would think so. I or think, particularly challenging, I should I think that it's challenging for the editors, like mainstream editors, I think that I came along in a time when I was perhaps very unique, tall, skinny, gangly. I come in from New York like, like a thunderstorm, but quietly. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't dress to make myself known. For instance, this gentleman has on his fabulous tropical Bermuda shorts <laughs> with his fabulous legs. <laughs> and um, I didn't dress with Bermuda shorts because I thought it was gonna gain attention. I didn't have any money, and people were very kind to me. I was given hand-me-down shirts by Karl Lagerfeld from Turnbull and Astor in, in, in Paris. And so I had hand-me-downs, but they were from Halston. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Which were pretty good hand-me-downs. <laughs> That's a great hand-me-down. <laughs> Halston all used to, so gave me hand-me-downs to decorate my house. You know, furniture, you know, antique Chinese furniture. He was just, it was in his garage. He was very generous and very kind. I remember my first fabulous tuxedo was from a, Hal a Halston tuxedo. But, I think that in 1974, when I got on the scene, there were very few people except that the models were on the scene, and, mm -hmm. Steve, and Billy Blair, 
Beth Ann, Alva Chin, and Tookie Smith were making waves. It goes in cycles. You know, the diversity moment comes, goes in cycles. They've been up and down, as you know, in the last years. Mm -hmm. There have been moments when it has been very, very full on. The late Franco Sassani did a whole issue in Italian Vogue with black models, right. and that was sold out twice. And so I think it just comes in the, the, the temperature and the climate. I think that hopefully in this climate of today with the administration the way it is, there will be more diversity. I think that people will accept and recognize. And people didn't have me here just because I was a tall, skinny black boy from the South. Right. I also had manners, the manners I was taught great manners. Southerness, the southerness went a long way with me. Can I just quote what a, a classmate of yours oh, yes. said? And I did not find this quote. This was in the, okay. the Hilton Hall's um, profile. Andre thought it was not, it was, it was just good manners to look wonderful. It was a moral issue. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is a moral issue. It is a moral issue. <laughs> Whatever you want to be dressed as, you dress up and don't let anyone tell you dressed inappropriately. You wear what you want. And I did not know that, but I did it. And I did it because I grew up in an environment where I was allowed to do whatever I wanted through my grandmother. And I went to church in the proper suits and the proper white shirts and the proper necktie. And when I got to Brown, I went home one Christmas and I wore a fabulous navy blue maxi coat that I'd bought in a thrift shop in Providence, Rhode Island with a gold braid over the sleeves, gold buttons, and it was fabulous. And my mother, God bless her, she did the best she could. We got out of the car at church in the churchyard. It's a rural church. And it was a big way to walk up to the yard to the church to the front door. And my mother said to me as I got out of the car, please, please, Andre, you have to walk behind me. I can't walk with you into the church in that phantom of the opera look. <laughs> oh, mother. Oh, mother, she did the best she could. God bless her. <laughs> and I realized at 27, wait, you're my mother. I respect you. What did you just say to me? <laughs> and so I said to her, well, mother, just go right ahead. Just go on. Go on. I'll wait for you to go into the aisle, and I'll come in later. And that's the moment I realized that I had to respect my mother, but she, could not have this, she did not have to rule my moment and my, my world. Talk to me about the, the challenges of being uh, the creative director, and for a long time, the only editor of color yes. uh, at Vogue. Um, and I know you spent a lot of time working very closely with Anna Winter. Yes. What did you learn from her, and what do you hope that she well, might what, have learned from you? Well, I think that she might have learned from me that I had very good visual ideas, and that I had very good communication skills with people, that I could put people at their ease and had a comfort zone with people, mm -hmm. you know, with the best, the top, the top people, Saint Laurent, Carl Lagerfeld. I mean, I could just go in a room and I felt that if I saw Mr. Saint Laurent, I didn't go, hey, Eve, how you doing? I went, hello. I sat down. I did my homework. And I, I learned from her about decisions must be made quickly. They must be followed through. You don't have to marinate your ideas. You have a decision, you follow through, you do the process, you get it to the page, and you resolve it, and you get it printed. And I think that I learned so much from her about decision making, about following your own instincts, whether you're educated or your eye has been trained. My eye was trained through my inspiration, and of course, Vreeland, and Anna went to En Vogue. So just follow your instincts. Just listen to your inner self, your inner mind, and base your decisions on that. And I often think about some stories I did at Vogue, and I'm very proud of my work at Vogue, when I was creative director. And I was, I, she made me the creative director. There had never been an African-American man who had ever been the creative director of Vogue. Go figure. You know, that's a big moment. And um, I was very young, and I just was so excited. I just went through every day with the energy and the passion to get the work done. I always said, bring home the bacon. I always wanted to bring home the beef for Anna Wintour. It was a challenge, uh, but it was a challenge I could rise to because the standards are so high. And we just dealt with the best. And as I said, I think she learned from me that Andre makes people who are in very important positions of power very relaxed. I think she could have observed from me that I could go into the room and Carl Lagerfeld would have an open conversation with me that was very comfortable, or Mr. Saint Laurent, or any other designer, Alexander McQueen, Zadina Laya, any of the great designers. I, I don't have a problem talking to people, as you can see. <laughs>
At the time, I mean, fashion has always engaged in social moments and political moments, but particularly now, it seems that fashion has become very directly political, whether it's sort of the activism that happened on the runway this, this past season, uh, Vogue's decision to officially endorse Hillary Clinton. I mean, how do you feel about fashion being that directly political? I, mean, I think, think it's think great. Yeah. I think it's great. I think fashion has always been very political. I think that in the 60s, the fashion in vogue was geared towards a certain kind of politic. The world wasn't what it is today. I think that politics were represented in a very elegant, esoteric way in vogue, as with the late Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy and her official portraits in her inaugural dress, by the way, who inspired all black women to go to the church. Let me tell you, the women in Baltimore were inspired. Everyone, everyone in my family was inspired by the late Jack Kennedy. The pillbox hat, the gloves, everything. So I think that it's very important that, you know, the political climate was very much inspired by Vogue when Mrs. Freeland was there. Just think, Vogue, Woodstock. Vogue had about eight color pages of Woodstock. Well, they couldn't show the nude people, but they showed the people <laughs> swimming in the lake with no clothes on. But they showed them, you know, mm -hmm. neck up or whatever. But those, those things were political then, and I think it's always been. I think that it's very important to establish um, the moment of First Ladies, and I think that I was very proud to do the first Michelle Obama cover yeah. with Connie Goodman, and that was very political. That was the highest achievement in my Vogue life, and I was so very proud of that. I really, really, I must say, when Anna gave me that assignment, I knew that she really thought a lot of me, and I was given that assignment, and I had to keep it a secret. We had meetings about it, and then I came to Washington and interviewed her when she was in the Hey Adams Hotel, and then Tony Goodman came down and did the cover shoot. She was the style editor for the cover shoot. So that's a great, great thing to have in my um, resume of knowledge, of memories. Do you think that she, Mrs. Obama, changed uh, what we expect from a she first certainly lady style-wise? I think she changed style-wise because she was her own. She, she did what she loved doing, and she did the mix greatly. She mixed high-low. She would do black and white. She mixed an Eyes and Elijah belt with something from uh, the, the, Nana, the Banana Republic, is the name of it yet? J. Crew. J. Crew. And then she would. <laughs> it's such an informed audience. <laughs> and then she would do things like, when she went to see the Queen of England, she had Tom Ford, a brilliant designer, American, make her an extraordinarily state gown in white, Grecian white, and she had the above the length gloves and leather made for her. And that is where she did the best thing. But she also created a very important thing as First Lady by creating her own advocacies, you know, for the, the veterans' families, uh, uh, childhood obesity, eating right, natural gardens, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that she will go down in history as one of the great First Ladies, like Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clap, clap, clap and I know that many years back, you also worked with Melania Trump. Yes, yes. When she was... That was then. <laughs> before, before she was married. <laughs> you know. Good time. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, Robin, ask your uh, question. <laughs> you may already have answered my question. <laughs> but I mean, she her style then was clearly very mm -hmm. Rococo mm -hmm. 1980s. I mean, and it's it's changed yes. significantly. Yes. I mean, do you see any indication that she might be willing or interested in using fashion in a similar kind of uh, communicative, uh, representational way? That I, I think that Melania is very selective and very well uh, chosen. She chooses her looks carefully, and there's obviously a great deal of uh, preparation for the looks. I think that uh, she is indeed a very, very confident person, and she chooses carefully for the clothes that look great on her. And she, it is always her choice. 
When uh, I helped her with her wedding trousseau, it was an assignment from Vogue, and I flew to Paris with Melania, not on the Trump jet. We went on commercial. And um, <laughs> she uh, went to all the great couture houses. And the great thing about Melania was, is her manners. She was very impressive. The, the couture houses were very impressed that she was not the arrogant Mrs. Trump hunting down a wedding dress. And then we went to a fabulous dinner at Valentino's Chateau. And it was fabulous. And I was sitting next to Melania. And she was so impeccable in her manners, in the way she spoke to people. And she was so charming. So she eventually picked a John Galliano Dior dress, right. you know. Allegedly, reportedly, it was $230,000 then. Uh, it was a beautiful dress. It was, she stood for eight hours one day to be fitted, and she didn't faint. And it was a very <laughs> wonderful experience. Now, I can only say that was then. And then I saw Melania a bit after she was married, and I've lost contact with her. So that was then. But I do think Melania will, hopefully, let's say, she'll be a great lady, a uh, first lady. I mean, she's just carefully chosen. I love the inaugural suit by Mr. Ralph Lauren. I mean, that was beautiful. Let's face it. You give, her, give her credit. Yeah. Ah, ah. And she, she nailed it. She nailed it. And she had the gloves. And she walked down the street for two minutes in the stilettos. Let me just tell you, personally, I've never seen any woman except Melania Trump who can walk for hours or stand in four and a half inch stilettos. She wore them at her wedding all through the night. She has, her, she has a DNA. Most women can't stand in four-and-a-half-inch stilettos for hours. She went through her wedding in four, two sets of four-and-a-half-inch stilettos, and I went once with her to something. Let me see, where did I go with her? She picked me up in a car. Oh, The Apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I okay, went because then. she asked me to go with her to The Apprentice in New York. And the, the car came up, the big stretch, and she was, I got in the car, and the, the legs were crossed. I said, Melania, how are you getting down the aisle in those stilettos? Oh, it's no problem. And she went down the aisle in those stilettos. Imagine, go figure. Well, Did I answer your question? Yeah. And we're, we're coming perilously close to uh, when we have to wrap up, but I want to ask you. Yes. Are we going to ask, Q, ask, are we going to Q&A? Yes. <laughs> well, I don't think we have a microphone, but. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't turn on me. <laughs> A couple questions. Just don't turn on me. <laughs> we want, I want to allow them okay. to. Uh, you have mentioned manners and civility <coughs> yes. and etiquette. And I am wondering if in any way you connect the lack of civility in the broader culture with, in some ways, fashion's own Absolutely. Uh, lack of Absolutely. formality, civility. Absolutely. Absolutely. As I say, the world is just fractured and effed up. <laughs> and manners have been thrown out the window. I think that manners make such a difference. And the one thing that stays with me is that whenever I achieved anything at Women's Wear Daily of Vogue, my manners were always in the forefront. And I just remember the process of going to Europe and being thrown into Women's Wear Daily in January of 1978. I arrived in the cold of night with 13 unmatched pieces of luggage. <laughs> And then I was immediately picked up by car and taken to a restaurant called La Coupole for a dinner with Karl Lagerfeld. And, but then I was completely freaked out <laughs> and very nervous and very insecure about so many things. I was, all, I was very insecure. The women's where they paid for my lodging. I was put up in a hotel, paid for. Everything was paid for for three months until I found an apartment. And I had to get up every morning and face an assignment, like you have to face a deadline. Mm -hmm. I had to be, I was told where to go. The assignments were given me from New York. And I was told that I had to go to Mr. Saint Laurent to review the collection in the Couture House. Well, of course, I had to put on my best look. I had to research what I was going to say. Questions were prepared. And I had to observe the protocol of the French Couture House. And there is a protocol in a French Couture House. Now, you just can't casually walk in there. You've got to meet with a receptionist and say who you are 
and then you've got to go in and you've got to genuflect sort of, it's like courtly. It's, and, and manners are everything. People will always remember your manners and they will remember your smile. And I remember the once a great lady from Philadelphia, the late Mrs. Angela Biddle Duke, hmm. who was photographed by Diane Arbus, and she was the reincarnation of Marie Antoinette. She was very wealthy. She had hair like Marie Antoinette. And she, <laughs> she came to Paris twice a year and had her clothes made as Givenchy. And she said to me in a letter, once I did a profile of her in Women's Women, she wrote me a letter, she said, you have the best manners, it will get you everywhere. You'll go as far as you want to go because of your manners. And the, the final question for me is that you once said that fashion in Vogue seems so kind, so opulently kind, a perfect image of things. Yes. Do you still yes. believe that fashion yes. is kind? Yes, absolutely. Fashion is kind because it gives you a sense of uh, uh, perfection, a moral code of your choice to, for you to attain, obtain to a kind of perfection in your own personal life, whatever that level is. When you read Vogue, you are trying to aspire to an aspirational goal that's perhaps higher than your regular norm in your regular life. If you look, flip through a page of Vogue, you'll see some blouse you want or some shoe you want. Well, honey, you're going to want to strive to get that shoe. And fashion is kind because fashion makes you feel better about yourself and you can approach the world with a smile. And I do have a question from the audience via Twitter, which I think is probably a question that everybody in here wanted to ask. Who's the favorite, per who's the favorite person you've dressed or styled for? Um. And I'll do the follow-up, which I'm sure people want to ask. Yes, is, yes, yes, yes. Which designers do you think are the most influential right now? Which designers do I think are the most influential? Well, I think that any designer with his weight in, in gold, who has been influenced by the great designer Yves Saint Laurent, is worth his medal. And Marc Jacobs would be one of the greatest. Yes, Mark. Marc Jacobs. It's like church, I love your response. <laughs> um, I also think the American designer Tom Ford in London is one of the great, great, great designers. And um, also I do think that the, one of the great designers is a mutual Prada. I love the Prada moment. Prada is accessible to almost everyone. Uh, but then again, I have always gone back to one of the greatest designers arguably in my lifetime was Yves Saint Laurent. I did not know Balenciaga, I did not know Coco Chanel, but I knew Yves Saint Laurent. And Oscar de la Renta and Yves Saint Laurent were two of my favorite designers because they gave you a world in a dress. They gave you a universe in a dress. And when you went to the boutique Reeve Gauche and bought that look, you had a universe on your back. Part of the brand it gave you confidence was it was Saint Laurent already. I remember my first Saint Laurent coat, I still have it in my closet at home, was a navy blue coat inspired by Austrian top coats. It was herringbone, navy blue. It was the best coat. I just had the most confidence when I wore that coat. Then I had Re Reeve Ghost velvet trousers, and I had the most confidence when I wore that, and my Reeve Ghost shirts. And it just gave me confidence when I was young to go through the, to the moment. Everything is a moment in fashion. And I think that, um, what was your first part of your question? The first, <laughs> yes. The first question was. Can we take questions from the audience later? Is that, who's your, your favorite person that you've dressed? Okay. And I'll give you, you know, I mean, no, a no, handful. No, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I'll give you a handful. <laughs> uh, Nicole Kidman. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. And, and why do you say, why do you say Because Nicole, Nicole Kidman? Kidman and I, she has such a great sense of humor. By the way, please, did you tune into HBO and Big Little Lies? <laughs> you all are on my page. <laughs> that was a stunning ensemble cast. Yeah. And she became the heroine in that. That was brilliant. That was one of her best performances. It's almost Oscar worthy. Yes. She should have gotten an award for that. So Nicole Kidman, when I met her at my first Vogue shoot, my first Vogue shoot, <laughs> Nicole Kidman was married to Tom Cruise. And uh, we met on a shoot, it was in California. And she was brilliant because it was in a private home and we had to close in a trailer and then we went into the private home to do the photographs on a staircase. And she is Australian and she, got on the balustrade, this, the banister, and she slid down the banister in a Versace dress. <laughs> and that just broke the ice. And then, it was a three day shoot, and then she used to be on the phone with Tom Cruise. And we were out on the beach one day, and we had a big trailer, and I was sitting on the side, on the ground. And she came to me and she said, you can't sit on the ground. I said, why, it's clean here. I picked up. She said, you can't sit on the concrete. Get up off that concrete. I said, why? 
She gives you hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved her then. And then when I got to Paris, Nicole Kidman was in town looking for a dress to wear to the Oscars, and John Galliano had done this extraordinary collection, and she chose, I recommended an absinthe. She needs was a read kind of a dress, and she chose that. It's about 1995 or something, in this beautiful, a slim column with fringe, and it was beautiful, and she chose that. Now, she came to the Met Ball last year in the most extraordinary Alexander McQueen cape and beaded gown. She is always a moment of perfection, and fashion is good to her. And another question from the audience is, who should we know that we don't? <laughs> who should you know that you don't know? I think you should know. Who should you know that you don't know? Well, I think you should know. I'm trying to think of who's really, really inspired me recently. I think that you should know, get to know someone like Beth Ann Hardison who's a great, great lady in fashion, and um, she's done so much for diversity, and she's done so much for that moment of keeping people aware of diversity, as you well know. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that she, A, was a great model, and she's a great role model. She once had a modeling agency. And I think one should get to know her. And do you want to know who should you know, living or dead, or both? I think, I think alive. Alive. And, I, <laughs> and I, I'm thinking that they also might mean design-wise. Oh, design-wise, design-wise. Um, I'm just inferring that. Okay, design-wise. Oh, I think you should know the great, 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 great shoe designer, Manolo Blahnik. Manolo Blahnik. Manolo Blahnik is the king of shoes. He is also very much in the school of Deanna Vreeland. Everything is a narrative with him because his shoes come from his head. He sketches, it's like shoo, shoo. It just comes out, out. Thousands of sketches. And he was five years old when he used to dress his pet monkey, make shoes for his pet <laughs> monkey in a Jinsky. But so that has stayed with him in his childhood. He grew up in the Canary Islands. He had a very privileged lifestyle. And he was shoo, and it's just going all, all up right up to today. And he's just brilliant. Every shoe, everything, I am always impressed. He's like my surrogate brother missing at birth. We are like, in everything, he so inspired me. He inspired me so totally. When I first met Nola, he was wearing tone on tone Reeve Gauche clothes, pink linen trousers, pink shirt, and pink linen oxfords with pink socks. But you know, when I first met him, I was in introduced to him, and we had to meet up at a place, and the place was Fire Island. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came, and he came down from Montauk. He'd been at been Andy Warhol's house with Bianca Jagger, and I was in Fire Island, and so he came, and i never forget he arrived on a Sunday afternoon, and he had the most extraordinary Vuitton luggage. And he came in these outfits, and every outfit was tone on tone, tone. And that was very inspiring. And he's also a great cook, too. <laughs> he's someone you should know for the literary quality. He has read everything. And he knows every single film. He can know every single film that's ever been made. He has a great knowledge of film. Well, I think that honestly is all that we have to for. No, but that's for. the question. You can't deprive these people of questions. I know. I'm so is sorry. Is there another event in this room? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Robin, let them ask questions. Hi, I'm, I'm getting the hook. I'm getting the hook. Oh, we're getting the hook. We have to go. I'm so sorry. But I, we so appreciate your being here. And bravo to Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. Thank you.